education and outreach. And uh, AACH has uh, started a webinar series this year to provide more education opportunities um, for our members and for other interested friends and guests um, to learn more about how we work towards improving communication from an education and or a research perspective. And uh, we're, we're really excited to have everybody here and to, to be bringing in some great speakers, um, like Martha Hayward, who is um, joining us today. Uh, Martha is here to talk with us about um, IHI strategies, so the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, and uh, her work there as the lead for public and patient engagement, um, really focused on these programs around person-centered care, which um, for those of you who are familiar with AACH know um, that we are very engaged in relationship-centered care, a patient-centered approach, and um, this idea of, of expanding to understand IHI strategies for person-centered care is, is really important to us. Um, so you registered for this webinar for a reason, so I'm sure, sure you know this. And uh, Martha brings so much um, expertise as a um, not only someone working in this sector now uh, in a very important role with IHI, but a cancer survivor herself and uh, a, a founding board member of a, a nonprofit in, uh, called Women's Health Exchange, and um, she's worked in patient and family advisory council roles. Um, for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and um, she has so many amazing accolades, and, and I'm excited to have her, her here with us. And she's also just a great person, and I'm happy to, to know you, Martha, so I appreciate you coming on. Um, she has also been secured, we're really excited about this, to speak as a keynote at our International Conference on Communication and Healthcare, um, hosted in New Orleans this October. So Martha will actually be presenting our morning keynote address on uh, Wednesday, the 28th of October. So maybe you'll get to see Martha live and in the flesh uh, at that time. So we're excited to have her. Uh, so I'm going to hand over the, the microphone and the video screen uh, to, to Martha and, uh, and, and let her begin. Remember, we hope you'll participate in the bottom right-hand corner, and I'll be trying to help field some of those questions uh, as, as, we, as we go and as Martha poses them. So Martha, welcome. Welcome to you, and thank you, everybody. Thanks for uh, uh, 52 people have signed on so far, so that's a that's a huge number. Thank you. So to get started, um, the very first thing that uh, I want to do is focus on the weather. Um, I live on the North Shore of Boston. I have endured 109 inches of snow this winter. As of I think three weeks ago there was still snow in my backyard, although yesterday was 80 degrees and I planted my tomatoes and cucumbers and a whole bunch of other things. But in the process, I have become completely obsessed and competitive around weather. And so what I'm going to ask each of you to do is to chat into the chat box your location and what today's weather is. And then I will determine who has the best weather. For me, I'm just going to tell you, we're at about uh, 72 degrees. Spring has sprung. The leaves are on the trees here in Boston. Thank God it's been the worst winter ever. Um, so please, oh, sunny in 82 in St. Louis. Well, OK, fine. Um, oh, good, we have some Boston people. We've got 84 in Sarasota. No breeze. Chicago is overcast and rainy. Yes. Yeah. Minnesota's 53. That's ridiculous. Yeah, Chris, don't we love this sunshine? Oh, this is great to see where everybody, <laughs> everybody's loving the. And there's rain in Denmark. I'm going to be in Denmark in a few months, so get rid of the rain. Well, that's really encouraging. I'm going to look through this later, and I'll give the. Um, actually, I I might award. Uh, well, unless we get a lot of other. Um, Oh, Tucson, Arizona. Well, sure, Amy, you always have perfect weather in Tucson, Arizona. Um, or the time that you're giving to this, um, I've been working with IHI for five years now, and um, at the time that they brought me on, and as you know, I, I, as Laura mentioned, I come to this work as a patient. Um, and I had been working with an organization here in Boston because we had just, Massachusetts was sort of three years ahead with 
the health care reform laws. And um, I was asked to come on to uh, IHI to really lead and integrate the patient voice into everything that we do within IHI and um, the programs that we provide for our clients and customers. And when I started at IHI, um, I, it was a huge job. And I think a lot of people, they, you know, they look at the, the concept of person-centered care or engaging patients and families in health and health care. And it seems ominous. And it seems, um, it, on the one hand, it seems, excuse the vernacular, but like, duh. Um, who, who's the most interested person in their own health? And on the other hand, it also seems daunting. On, how do you go about doing something that seems like it ought to have already been done? And so when I started um, with IHI, I referred to, well, first let me just start. Um, IHI, for those of you, I'm, I'm not certain if everybody uh, really knows what IHI is, but we're an international company and um, we work everywhere from Saudi Arabia to Detroit to Tucson, Arizona, where the weather's always good. Um, and our our goal is to work with partners and other organizations and healthcare organizations. And I want to um, draw your attention to the circle in the, in the bottom, which is our, our five areas of focus, um, <clears throat> patient safety, improvement capability, the triple aim, and quality, cost, and value. Um, the one that's of particular significance is person and family-centered care. Um, this has been added over the past two years in our strategic plan as a major area of focus for the work that we're doing worldwide. And really has become the time, for those of you who are involved in healthcare um, right now, I'm sure you're seeing that this is the era of person-centered care and of engaging people not only in healthcare but in their health. And people are thinking beyond the four walls of hospitals and beyond healthcare to how do we work with communities towards health. And the goal in prison center care, which is for IHI, which is here, and this is internationally, um, is this, this idea of partnerships between clinicians and individuals um, where the ultimate goal is optimal functional health and quality of life in every area from birth to end of life. Um, we're very focused, as you'll see later, on the having uh, people live their lives in a health in, in their idea of optimal health through to the last day of their life. So we don't we, we actually focus on end of life and don't deny it. Um, I, I, how many of you have seen this in health affairs, um, the uh, patient engagement? was referred to as the blockbuster drug. And I've always felt that um, it, engaging patients, their families, is the, the final transformation or, and the, the key transformation to making uh, our healthcare systems functional um, and moving towards excellence. So as I said, when I was starting with, um, with IHI, I referred to some work that I had done with IHI when I was with the former organization, where we were looking at the, the, the issues was, and so this was uh, seven, eight years ago, and we were looking and saying, people are talking about patients. People who have patient family advisory councils, but we're not getting traction. And so we came to the research team at IHI and said, help us understand. Let's figure out how might we um, develop a framework whereby the work will get traction. And this, this uh, everything at IHI you'll come to recognize as bundles and triangles. So here's my circle. Basic theory here from Don Berwick's and when he wrote for the IOM, Crossing the Quality, quality Chasm. And the, the theory is here that in order to have an effect at any level, you have to be doing work at every level. So in order for, for instance, if you look at the personal at the center, um, that would be the patient in the bed at the bedside. In order for that patient to feel really connected to what's going on in the hospital and for the nurses and doctors who are serving that patient in that space, 
things have to happen at the system level, the organizational level, and the public level in order for, you, you can't just focus on one area. Um, the information that I get around what it might like be like to be in a hospital, I get when I'm taking walks in the park or I'm visiting family or I'm at a cocktail party and everybody always has a story about, I had a great experience, I had a horrible experience, and that's what informs me. Um, and so when I go into the hospital, because we don't, none of, none of us really spend a lot of time planning to go into the hospital, um, I've got all that information, uh, communication, that is informing what I anticipate my role to be when I'm in the bed. And what we found as we tested this framework with about 150 stakeholders in Massachusetts was that lots of people were doing things at the bedside level, at the personal level. Lots of people were looking at having patient family advisory councils, having patients involved um, in a number of ways with what was going on and improvement on the floors. At the organizational level, most of the organizations that we were dealing with had patient family advisors or people who were working with leadership had, had patient family advisors on the board. But nobody was working at the public level. And so if you think about it, all the work that was happening was, ha was happening inside the four walls of the healthcare system. But nobody was informing that one person, you and me, the users of that system, of A, the changes, B, the expectations, and what, they might, what we might expect as we become patients when we go into um, a hospital or a doctor's office or enter into the healthcare system in any way. So if you just think, hold that framework in your mind, we can refer back to it at any point, but this, this, you're seeing how I think. And um, which is a scary thought. A lot of people would not want to be inside my head, but this is partly how I think. Um, and what I want to share with you today are some of the programs and the, the major, the landmark programs that IHI is working with that um, hit at each of these levels to give you a sense of what we're doing to make a difference in organizations and make a difference in healthcare and health all over the world. So to begin, the most important thing probably that I've learned over the past five and a half years um, is that when you address change within an organization, immediately what you hear from people within the organization is that it's somebody else's job. Everybody's been, <laughs> everybody knows whose job it is, but it's not theirs. Um, and what I've learned is that Culture change, particularly, is everybody's job. Everybody's job. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you today are programs that, that strike at every level. Um, when you're engaging patients to family, I'm going to be talking with you about a program called What's, What Matters to You. Engaging staff, um, storytelling. There's a, I'll, I'll offer you a piece on storytelling. And, Engaging, and understand when you say engaging anybody, it takes more than one to engage. So you're engaging patients and families. Because more and more uh, hospitals particularly, and now office practices are really focused on having patient family advisors, possibly having a patient family advisory council. But many don't quite know how to make that happen um, and what it really looks like to be working with patients and families toward decision making and change. And then finally, engaging the public. And, and that's a program that we have uh, called the Conversation Project. So those are, those are the four main things that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So <clears throat> what matters to you? Wouldn't we love it if more people would just ask us on any given day what matters to us? Um, this is the whole concept of what matters to you is moving from what's the matter in any clinical situation, moving from what's the matter to what matters to you. And Michael Berry and Susan Edgman Levitan, her two of our colleagues in Boston, um, uh, presented this in the New England Journal, this concept um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and our CEO Maureen Bisignano has been using it frequently in keynotes around the world. And 
more and more, you know, we're all using this concept and, and in fact, have this initiative to really uh, make this ubiquitous in all clinical interactions. So, um, oh wait, we have somebody from Mexico. What, Vashti, you have to do 25 degrees with that in Fahrenheit. Sorry, I just got, um, I, I just got uh, distracted by what the weather is in Mexico. Um, so this whole concept of moving to what matters to you, it absolutely resonates with everyone. It doesn't matter the country, the culture, the age, the system. Everybody gets it. And when we talk with, particularly with clinicians, about changing culture and having more time, the kinds of conversations that they're having with patients, the actions that we get, um, that I've experienced, it's all have to do with, but I don't have enough time. And somehow this, this phrase, what matters to you, resonates with people and they don't object. It feels like a tool. It feels like a tool to say, um, in the context of what we're talking about, what really matters to you? And when we address that question, it is astounding how the pertinent information, the change in the relationship um, that happens when you ask this question in clinical inter interactions. Um, you know, why does this happen? Because we're reaching out to another person. I mean, this is what patients talk about all the time. I don't, I want to be human. I want to matter. Um, connecting with the human being. It, for clinicians, what you end up finding out is what, um, what the driving forces are in a person's life. And, and let me give you an example. Um, we were working with a, a group of hospitals out in California, um, uh, the, the VHA, and we did a physician communication pilot. And um, we had the physicians, they, had, they were small tests of change, and they had, their job was to knock on the door, enter, introduce themselves, sit down, and at the end of their, what they were sharing with the patient, to ask, um, what else can I do for you? A, a question of concern is what we were talking about. You know, have, have I covered everything? Well, we learned very quickly over their first test change. So three doctors in three different rooms, and they came back together, and they said, actually to me, I don't sit down because um, it, it has never felt comfortable. And when I asked the question, what else can I do for you, they were hearing things like, um, my tea is cold, there aren't enough towels in the bathroom, I need another one of those warm, those wonderful warm blankets that they take out of the heaters, those are the best. Um, and th these aren't questions that are important to the interaction between you and your surgeon. And so we started to work with that question, well, how could we get more pertinent information? And so we, we changed the question to what's your having, so you understand the physician has, the surgeon or physician has just, uh, spoken with the patient about what their situation is. And the, the question that they landed on it was, what's your greatest concern right now? And what they heard from the first three people, and I've already forgotten one of them, but two of the people, was a woman who had come in with a stroke. And when the doctor asked, what's your greatest concern? She said, today is my 40th wedding anniversary, and my husband had planned a huge surprise for us, and I know that it was a big deal, and I feel awful that here I am in the hospital. And so the people on the floor got together and got a bottle of champagne and a cake, and they celebrated their anniversary. Um, another fellow is, is a construction worker, and he had, he had fallen on the job and broken his leg. He had had surgery. He had been in the hospital for 48 hours. And when the doctor asked, what's your greatest concern, he said, I live alone and I have two German shepherds in my apartment um, and I have no family around here. And it turned out one of the nurses lived in the same apartment complex and so she was able to take care of the dogs until he got out of the hospital.
to the things that are preventing somebody from healing. And a person who has two dogs at home and nobody to help, that's not a person who's going to be able to relax and focus. So asking this question, what matters to you, it connects people on so many levels. And most importantly, I think, um, this sense of personal goal setting, what's important to you um, as a physician may not be what's important to a patient. And when you have, even when you're diagnosed, somebody with cancer or a long-term condition, working with that person, the number of people that I've known who've had uh, hip replacements and that sort of thing and said, I just want to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle or uh, be able to hike the White Mountains once again, those are goals that you set. So it's, it's, it's really brilliant. And asking this question um, can happen in every kind of setting. Um, when people, by asking, you know, if a, if a um, phlebotomist comes in and asks the question when doing a simple procedure, just, you know, putting in an IV or something, and asking some question that, that looks like, uh, hand is often a response that you get. When a key place where we know we lose so many people and so much information is in transition. Um, there's a story uh, that was written by a person that I met in Sweden. Um, it's one of the most beautiful. She had been in the ICU for two months and clearly had been near death and had recovered to where they wanted to put her on a floor transitioning her to the floor and she panicked and I understood this um, I understood this having been a cancer patient because when somebody tells you uh, your treatments over there's a sense of panic sounds strange doesn't it but there's a sense of panic everybody else is celebrating and saying oh your treatments are over but on the other hand I as a patient have become very good at being a patient and if I'm treating my cancer, what am I doing to it? And what happens to all these people who have made me safe, all these people with whom I have relationships and with whom I feel most comfortable in the hospital? So this woman who was transitioning from ICU uh, to, after three months, um, to the flo to a, a floor, when asked what she wanted was to have Two, two of her nurses who had been with her mom It's a really important thing to think about. You don't think of the patient's perspective in that, in that uh, moment. Annual visits, end of life is probably one of the most important, um, and we'll get into that a whole lot more. So again, back to you know the best question here, um, and, and as I said, what more can I do for you is, is never the right question. Um, but some of the options are, you know, what's the you know, has your goal in mind? So I want to ask some of you, I, I know we haven't, um, I haven't asked exactly what people do uh, within the healthcare industry, but in your work, can you think about what you might ask on a day-to-day -day basis um, for those who have contact with patients? You can type things in if you want. Yeah, Martha, thank you. That's a, that's a great question uh, in terms of thinking about skills. And um, I noted earlier while you were, while you were talking, Amy uh, typed a, uh, a message saying that she really needed support in terms of engaging, engaging staff, really. And uh, this idea of what, what do our participants here on the webinar say, what actions do you take to help people express what matters to them. The questions you've posed are really great. And, um, you know, I know at the AACH a, 
a lot of, of our members and um, people are, are really involved in finding ways to communicate and, and, and listen and hear about what matters. So um, I'm excited to see what people are typing here. Yeah, I can see typings going on. So, um, so we had one, how are you doing and how is your spirit holding up, which is a very kind, um, I mean, I'm having trouble, okay, here we go. Yeah, so uh, people are typing a lot, so there are a lot of people uh, responses coming in at once. Um, I see Jonathan says, uh, the idea of having broad and open-ended questions, I, I, I think that really helps. Um, I, I noted uh, earlier that um, Anna had typed that the other thing about the greatest concern really be broad and, and, and help elicit those concerns earlier and in a more open way. Absolutely. And when, when the physician or the clinician who is inviting in connection, um, how has your life been since you were last here? I love that. One, one doctor shared with me um, uh, that he was with a woman who he was trying to diagnose and determine what was the underlying cause of, uh, of deep vein thrombosis. And he was asking her all the standard questions, do you fly, are you active, and going through all of this. And finally he looked at her and he said, okay. So what do you do when you're not in my office? And she said, oh, I'm a quilter. Ding. So not only was he hearing about who she is and understanding something about her, he was also able to understand why she had deep vein thrombosis. And when, when he started to really talk to her, I mean, she was a major quilter, hours and hours and hours. She, she, that was her life. Um, a lot of people are talking about active listening. Um, and I think that one of the things about saying what matters to you, the word you is in there. Uh, Amy says the audio is cutting out. Um, but, but by addressing the question, you're inviting somebody to speak about something very specific within context, and you need to listen. So how can I make your experience uh, today easier? Um, later in my uh, presentation, I'll share with you a very moving story about the words, how could we make this the best possible day for you? I love those words. It, but do you see how the framing of the question can is so important? Um, how can we make today the best possible day? for you. How can I make your experience today better or easier? I love that one, Joanne. Um, deeper. Um, and it w well, I think there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a question of where you're putting the emphasis. Um, because we are not, we are truly trying to develop trust and loyalty. Um, so it's really interesting. So that was fun. Thank you for um, joining in. I just, uh, and yes, Susan, patients do, and it, patients do need to know that their voice matters, and this is one way of getting there. So what we're doing at IHI is this is a call to action. So we have a huge um, a conference in an international conference in uh, Orlando, Florida, every year the first week of December. Um, if you want to go to ihi.org and check it out, it's uh, it's truly amazing. There are about six thousand healthcare workers, uh, patients, families um, there from all over the world, and every year the um, the keynote is done by our CEO. And then uh, the last keynote is done by Don Berwick, our former CEO. 
So this year, Maureen's Viziano's call to action was, what if every clinician, staff member, and community health worker routinely asked what matters to you and listened attentively at every encounter with individuals and their families? What would we learn? How would this understanding enhance our ability to develop genuine partnerships with patients? to co-create a more customized plan to meet their express needs, values, and preferences. So that was the call to action, and we've, and we've asked people to, um, we've gotten reports back from people from everywhere from Africa, Scotland, and all over the United States, people talking about what happens when they, they ask, what matters to you? And it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, I think we'll be publishing something on that, but it's, it's a really, fun. Uh, so Joan says, address the importance of follow through. Um, I don't, I'm, I, I want to be clear that I'm getting the, excuse me, the question right, Laura, but um, clearly you cannot listen to what matters and then not do anything about it. Um, but you also have to have boundaries about what you can and cannot do. Um, I mean, if, you know, if somebody mm -hmm. says I, it really matters to have great ice cream every day, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that's every doctor's uh, point. We tend to find that people, given the nature of the question, we tend to find that that people asking and the people responding really get um, that this is that this is about the clinical interaction. So we're not seeing a lot of people asking for things that aren't doable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people aren't asking. Uh, to go on vacation for a week there. But I have to think about that. Well, yeah, I, 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 I love that you're, you're grappling with that, Martha. And also, it, it, is, a, it, it is a big question. And I think, um, you know, it, here at AACH, we're often grappling with the skills-based approach to communication. And uh, I think that's partly what Joan might be um, moving towards, just that we can't just say what matters to you and then not listen and act. Um, so, and there also are boundaries. So um, I, I think there are a lot of good follow-up tools out there um, to, to help support that issue, Joan. Um, so Martha, maybe if we have time at the end, we can come back to that conversation. Great, great, okay. So moving along, I want to share with you a few things about storytelling. This has become one of my favorite things to talk about um, because I see the power of stories. Um, I see, and I see where people And let me tell you, um, there, was a, there was actually a physician who worked in my office, and, and we have um, Monday morning staff meetings. Every Monday morning, we have an hour-long staff meeting. And this physician would often say, I have a patient story. And then she would share something that happened in the hospital the week before. And finally, I had to say to her, actually, that's not a patient story. That's a doctor's. That's your perspective. That's your, that's your story. It is a story that involves a patient, but it's not a patient's story. So there, there's a lot of nuance in the language here. So be aware of what you're, if you're sharing a, a story about a patient from your perspective or from the patient's perspective. Two very different. Julie has written, you know, how to engage staff in culture change. It is the number one way in which uh, staff is deeply affected and can be brought into the whole process of culture, culture change. The mo one of the, the most important things is that healthcare systems, hospitals particularly, are completely focused on process. And people are constantly losing connection to the process. And when you lose connection to a process, um, you lose a lot. Yeah, I had an experience over the past couple of years. I was admitted to the hospital, and I was in a room that was meant to have two beds. Mine was the only bed in there. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, um, somebody came in. She had a clipboard. And she went to the whiteboard on the other side of the room. And she started to write down all this information. And I said, excuse me, I believe that's my information because there's no other bed in here. And she said, nope. It says whiteboard 32. This is bed 32. It's going on here. And she left. So <laughs> all my information was written on the other side of the room where I couldn't see it. There's somebody who has lost connection. 
Um, and stories help us stay connected to why we're doing things. That that whiteboard is a means of communication. It's a, it's a safety feature, but it's also a means of communication between me and my family. Uh, stories connect the head and heart, and they really demonstrate, and everybody hears this, they demonstrate the humanity of our work and what, re what really matters to us as healthcare professionals. Um, and they reflect their culture. So I, a friend of mine tells a story that when she was working in a, uh, in a, um, in an ICU, she was an ICU nurse, and she had a man who was dying, and his wife was was with him, and they shared the story that they had gotten that he absolutely loves fireworks, and they had gotten married on July 4th so that they could pretend the fireworks were for them. Well, the day was July 4th. And so she literally created an ICU bed for him in a stairwell where he could see the fireworks. And he died the next day. But he shared that July 4th fireworks with this woman. That story says a lot about that culture, that she, as an ICU nurse, had the power to act, that she was supported in it, and that the value was these last moments of this couple together. It's stories like that that tell us what our culture is and what we value. Um, where we tell stories in the clinical interaction, when we're looking for this sense, and all, pa all patients are, that sense of, is there anybody else who's been through this? And what patients tend to find is this, you know, we're faced with, whether it's a broken leg or a cancer diagnosis or a diabetes diagnosis, whatever it is, we feel, because it's the only time we've ever dealt with it, we feel lost and afraid. And if a physician shares a story, not, not denying HIPAA laws, but says, I had a patient very much like you, and she's now the mother of two, and is back to running. There's, see what that does? I'm not alone. There, there are great opportunities. The tiniest story can make a, a difference. Team interaction, this is back to staff being involved in the um, culture change and in leadership. At board meetings, this is the place where you, where you speak out what the truth is of what challenges your organization and what your organization. And leaders sharing stories is incredibly powerful. I wanted to share this with you. This is a friend of mine. Her name is Kristen Lynn. She's now living in Copenhagen. But she has a son with um, special needs. And she was asked um, by somebody to give, her, give them a sense. This is a way of telling a story. Of give, to help her to understand the sense of what um, his medical treatment involved. And if you can see on this, in the bed. Um, in the blue is the healthcare system. Green is the support system. His, his uh, recreation community. He needs Medicaid. His doctor. He needs the patient department to know his allergies and all of that. And the the story. And how much do you already know about this woman and this family by looking at this? There are many ways to tell a story. And this from um, Mark Vance, who uh, is at Harvard. Um, one of the, what's really meaningful is that knowing a person's story not only teaches us how to act, it inspires us to act. And I think for me, I really believe that inspiration means a great deal. It doesn't mean anything if there's not action behind it. Um, and that's why the teaching how to act and the inspiration is the same. But for so many, the inspiration has left the building. And stories help us bring it back in. I want to share with you quickly about Always Events. Um, we at IHI were given the Always Events, um, the trademark Always Events, from the Picker Institute, which closed a few years ago. And always events are the anecdote to 
uh, never events, which is, it's pretty obvious what the never, things that should never happen, you should never cut off the wrong leg of a person. Um, and all these events are a very positive, meaningful way to address things that have to do with patient and family centered care. So they're defined as those aspects of the patient and family experience that should always occur when patients interact with the healthcare system. These are available um, to everybody. If you go on the IHI website, there are um, ways in which you can, you can sort of do it yourself. We can you know, come and help you do this. But um, the key behind it is that the, the healthcare systems have moved from doing two patients, you have a gangrenous leg, I cut it off, I send you home, to doing four. And a lot of hospitals are stuck in doing four and thinking they've made it, but really co-design and patient-centeredness has, has to do with doing with patients. Very, very different, very significant change. And all, all these events are all about doing with patients. Um, they're positive. One thing uh, about never events and the safety and quality world, remember, the patients do not experience what does not happen to them. Got that? You didn't cut off my left leg instead of my right leg. So I did not experience an error. An error. However, that's not part of my experience. The patients assume safety and quality when they go into hospitals. Um, always events are Um, the criteria for always events, and the number one criteria that makes me love this whole process is that they're important and that they're important to patients and families. This is very different from somebody on a floor or somebody in a boardroom saying this is what's important to us and so now we're going to implement a new process. This is about going to patients and families in your own setting and saying what's important to you. And when a patient, when, the, when you get a critical mass of people whose response is, it's important to me that I feel like a human being here, how do you translate that into an always event? One system might say, you know what, that's an opportunity to use the what matters most. Another system might say, we're going to wear name tags with our first name and give the same name tag to, to patients. There are all kinds of processes that you can create um, to address what patients identify as important, that's up to you. And that, that will be your always event. That they're evidence-based, measurable. So this is very important because they, there has to be measurable behaviors that we're changing. You know, everybody knows the definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Behaviors have to change if we're going to change the patient experience. And because 99% of what patients require and ask for and beg for and plead for are communication-based changes. They're all affordable. It doesn't involve uh, billions of dollars of equipment and changing the way everybody does the things. Um, again, you'll have these slides, but these, the picker principles are based on what hundreds and thousands of patients being asked what's important to them. And these are the areas that people consistently speak to. Um, it's always important. You should have these posted in your brain someplace. This is really important stuff. So always events, um, they, they really raise the bar on uh, the provider and patient experience. And they are a way in which you can start to work with patient and family advisors toward a common goal. Um, in the co-design process. I just can't say enough about it. It's a great program. Check it out. Um, so here's the, you know, from patient to process and then bringing reliability and uh, performance measures to that. Um, and this is all in IHI language. I could do five hours just on all these events, but I just want to give you sort of an introduction as to what we're working on. And then finally, perhaps my pet project is um, the conversation project. I don't know how many people have heard of the conversation project.
healthcare wishes will be expressed and respected. So let's think about that for a second. Everyone, end of life um, care wishes are expressed and respected. So where do they need to be expressed? At Well, death, and by the way, we've done all the research, and 100% of us will die, despite the fact that we'd like to think we won't. But how many of us, and I'd love to see in the, uh, in the chat, how many of you have had the end-of-life conversation in, in good health um, with your family? So... The goal of the Conversation Project is to raise awareness and make death, this little small goal here, make death a conversation that is being had at all kitchen tables throughout the country. But, and to make certain that if we have a family member um, who decides to access the healthcare system as part of their end of life plan, um, that their, their wishes will be respected. And so we're working both with the public and we're working with health healthcare institutions to teach them to become what we call um, conversation ready. Uh, yeah. And Martha, I'm, I'm noticing people are typing some, some questions and some responses and um, I, I just wanted to point out, I'm seeing some people say, they maybe have had that conversation themselves, but the hard part was having it with um, a family member who was facing end of life. And um, I think personally that's one of the things about the conversation project and, and conversation ready, which I know you're transitioning to, that, that it's helpful it, it, when you address those uh, ways that you can help people be more ready and skilled in having those really difficult conversations. Right. And um, so here they are side by side, the Conversation Project and Conversation Ready. Um, and I want to share with you, so as I said, to, to raise the awareness, to make tools that are accessible to people, and to reach people where they work, live, and pray um, about this idea of having the conversation. The website and the starter kit for the Conversation Project have been, um, hi Gloria, um, yeah, I, so Gloria Patel is, is, is writing in that she had the conversation with her mom and, and the conversation went very well and we felt it was time well spent and a really good conversation to happen. And what we find is when people enter into these conversations, um, there's, a, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of closeness and a self-discovery. First of all, think about the fact that as we live longer and healthier lives, we experience more death than our predecessors did. So we might experience the death of a parent, a grandparent, and a great-grandparent, because we're living longer. And we also, given the fact that we're America and we are the melting pot, as families form and reform and form again, um, we do all develop our own culture around death and what is comforting to us. In my family, we are a family of cremators. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we, uh, we've always lived on the water and um, been sailors and that sort of thing, so there's been a lot of ashes uh, thrown into the ocean. I think that might be illegal, so don't tell anybody, okay? Um, but what the conversation starter kit does and what the... the, the, uh, the uh, But it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't start out with, do you want to be in a, will you allow somebody to put you on a ventilator? It's more about who you are, what type of person. And notice what the first question is that we ask people to answer, which is what matters to me. And what's nice about the starter kit is that you can go online, you can fill it out yourself, you can send the link to five family members and say, let's all do this together and see what we come up with. Um, there are a million ways to do it that, that 
it feels easier. And then as you move through it, these are the kinds of questions we created where um, you get a better sense of who you are. So, you know, as a patient, I only want to know the basics. I want to know as much as I can. That says something about who you are. Um, and so it's, it's a way to really explore how you react with it. Who do you want to talk to? When might be a good time to talk? Um, a lot of people find that at, at a birth or particularly after a funeral, um, when people are doing, you know, if, if some ma any, any major events that's happening uh, in the family, lots of people, I wouldn't say lots of people like to do it at Thanksgiving, but we encourage people to do it at Thanksgiving. Um, and where would you feel comfortable? Really think about the setting um, and what you want to achieve. So I encourage you, I want to leave time for people to ask questions, but those are four areas of, uh, that we're working on. I encourage you to have a conversation and to share the, the starter kit. Um, and finally, what I want to offer you, I, I, I won't play this because I don't uh, trust uh, WebEx and video, and I don't want to take the time away from our discussion here. Um, but there are so many brilliant things on YouTube that can be used as ways to communicate. And this is just one story. Um, the gentleman that you're looking at is Lachlan Farrow. Um, he, works very, he has worked very closely with us on the conversation project. He's, he, when uh, Ellen Goodman, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, Ellen Goodman, started the conversation project with us, and he was actually her mother's doctor, and she referred to him as the soul, the doctor of the soul. Um, and this is, Lachlan came to a meeting, and, he, and when the meeting was over, he reached over me and he said, I have to show you what we filmed yesterday. And now it's turned into a YouTube video. Um, and it's just a beautiful moment of what matters to you. So those are some of the strategies that we're employing. I know it was a lot really fast, but I hope I made the point going back to the um, the model for the uh, the framework for public and patient engagement that we need to be working at every level. And as Don Berwick said two years ago at our huge conference, he said um, it used to be that people would ask me where where we need to start the work, and now I say we need to be doing everything every day in every way because this has got to change. So uh, with that said, I encourage questions, um, thoughts. Uh, so thank but you, I really, Martha. I really suggest you take this, uh, you, you get this YouTube thing. Yeah, th thank you so much, Martha. And you did cover a lot of information. and. Uh, I haven't uh, found the YouTube thing to post in there yet, but I've been pasting some other links. Like the, I just pasted in the resource page for the Always events, and um, I, you know, I, I think if anyone wants to type a question, we have a few minutes before our time is officially over. And uh, I was curious if anybody wanted to type into the chat box um, some initiative that they may be doing with the Always event, because I've heard a lot of great examples from people in the past of you know, what their system is doing uniquely for always events or using the toolkits that IHI helps to provide for support. Um, I, I'm curious, do you have any um, particularly interesting examples, Martha, of, of an always event activity? Well, uh, oh, hi, Jonathan, how are you? Sorry, I'm seeing all these fun people on here. Um, yeah. So the, um, when, when Picker, was working with the Always Events. They create. They worked with um, 26 uh, groups that were doing Always Events, and and one in particular that was probably the most is the most well known. I want to have a better sense of how I'm going to take care of myself when I get home and. Um, Unity Point up in uh, Iowa uh, took on the dis discharge instru instructions and really um, making teach back reliable and spreading it throughout the organization. Um, so that was the response. I will, if you go on ihi.org and, and go to Always Events, we have examples of, of various Always Events. I've been uh, tried, tested in our church. We are currently working with the National Health 
in England and various other locations and piling new always events, always looking for who are to try them. The one that I want to see somebody do is we will always be with a that uh, the segue from from multiple points. Joan asks about what, if anything, IHI is doing to influence training of medical students, nursing students, and pharmacy students. So I, I, I was in immediately thinking about open school and um, yeah. the impact that open school. Anything else you might add to speak to that that question? Well, if you aren't familiar with the IHI Open School, I do encourage you to check it out, um, again, at IHI.org. Um, open School uh, is, I think it's 1,100 different courses that are available in there um, to augment uh, current medical education. It was done understanding that changing the way uh, we're taught is going to take eons, and so rather than try to change large institutions, he created it IHI, the IHI School, and most of the courses are free. Um, I think one millionth course was taken somewhere in last, just in February, so a lot of people all over the world, and we have a whole track on patient family centered care, end of life, it's very patient centered, um, and I encourage you to check it out and check out courses that are available there. Great. Thank so you. yeah, Pat says she's she's been using the open school, and there are chapters at most universities, most uh, medical institutions, and universities, uh, but they're available to those. Yeah, and um, I I know that the conversation project has kind of transitioned to um, have some some more training support and tools of uh, for actual students and practitioners, clinicians, um, to help them facilitate the conversation so that it's expanded beyond family kitchen table concept. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I mean, there's so much so much knowledge to, to share from the community and, and specifically we're interested in your views on person-centered care and family-centered care. And um, we're so excited, Martha, that you're going to join us as a um, speaker and, and have a chance to elaborate on topics at our national conference on community and health care this fall. And uh, I'm sure people have more questions. We are going to distribute um, the PowerPoint slides in PDF form to those who registered for this webinar, and we'll also distribute the recorded link to this. And of our community today. Thanks so, so much. I really appreciate how much people have been active in the conversation. And just to go back to the beginning, Boston wins on the weather thing. I know some of you have good weather, but you know we've had a really tough winter. So to us in Framingham and Boston and everywhere else around here, we won. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. We'll we'll let you have it. You've earned it, and uh, we really appreciate your insight and the good work you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you.